Hello, my name is Mark Johnson and today I'm going to talk about methodology which is a topic that puts uh, many students and some uh, academics to sleep and today I'm not going to talk about the boring stuff I'm not going to go through the sort of methodology textbooks and talk about grounded theory or quantitative methods or any of those things I actually want to focus on the issue of value because I think when you come to find the methodology that is right for your own research problem and you have to find the methodology that's right for your own research problem what you're really doing is exploring your own values the things that you think about the world and this link between methodology and value is is perhaps surprising but really when we do education research we're really wanting to say you know doing this intervention is a good thing this kind of context is a bad thing and you want through your research to say well you know you can determine these factors which are good and which are bad but one way or another we're articulating some kind of value judgment and that means that the whole issue of value is a personal thing as well as something that might be embedded in some sort of methodological approach when we try to do this kind of research it means that we have to inspect our own values what we think the world is like because lying behind any methodology is some kind of view about the way the world is like so this is the question what do you think the world is like that you can gain knowledge of it through research this week I want you to engage in a, a an exercise where you look at a piece of your own writing and I want you to ask, well, what are your conclusions? Well, that should be easy enough. You'd be able to go through to the end and say what your conclusions are. But then say, well, what, by what method do you reach your conclusions? So what method are you using to reach your conclusions? And it may not be entirely clear, so you might have to think about that. And then this gets tricky, because if you think your method is a good one, think about what the implications are that what must the world be like for your conclusions to be true so if you're doing an empirical uh, test where you do before and after testing and that works and you think that that's the right thing what must the world be like for that to actually work consistently chances are you're actually not that sure about your method because you were told to do it like that but you've got to think well why did you choose it why does it seem appropriate and then what does your choice of method tell you about what you are like, about what your values are, about what matters to you in your research? So this is, this is, this is an introspective uh, exercise. Now, when we come to know anything, we're in a social world and things happen to us all the time. There are events that happen. Our certainty about certain things in the world, like uh, the sun rising in the morning, there's, there's a certain pattern of uh, regularity and it's through that pattern of regularity that we come to sort of have certain common sense assumptions about the world now the person who really thought about this is the man who, whose picture is there called David Hume he basically argued that when we see regular, regular events we draw conclusions from our own experience and we can share our experience with other people who see the same regularities and eventually we can come to some sort of agreement as to what might be causing those events. Problem is, in the physical sciences, which is what Hume was most concerned with, it's much easier to get regular events than it is in the social sciences because they're much messier. Now actually, what scientists agree amongst themselves, Hume argued at least, what they agree amongst themselves is the causes of something happening. Um, and this is interesting because when we go to a much earlier philosopher, philosopher Aristotle, he says, we do not have knowledge of a thing until we have grasped its cause. And just think about that for a second. I mean, how do we know, how do we have knowledge of fire? Well, it's because we have an idea of what causes fire. And I mean, there's a chemical cause, there's a, you know, someone striking a match, all sorts of reasons why we might try and explain fire. There's a deeper question as to whether causes are real uh, or whether they're the invention of scientists in the light of regular events. Now, David Hume thought that causes were basically the inventions of scientists. Scientists looked at experiments and they invented causes. Aristotle 
disagrees. He thinks causes are real. So this introduces some quite complex problems and they're particular problems when we come to look at social life because when we try to look for regularities in social life they're not really there. We try to measure it but we know that we're part of social life so any kind of objectivity that we might have is, is compromised. There are, however, many techniques used for measuring uh, social life, and we use surveys and questionnaires and user response and test results and interviews. And some social scientists think that we can produce regularities by using statistics. So we can average results, and if we do our statistics right, we can produce statistical regularities. And then you can explain the statistical regularities. But the fundamental question here is whether the real world is the same as the statistical world, as the world that's constructed out of statistics. And, um, of course, many people would say that it's not. Um, amongst those people, there are people who say that actually the problems with being unable to measure anything in social life means that actually it's, it's impossible and we should instead focus uh, not on the sort of knowledge outcomes produced by measurement, but on the process of trying to find out things. And in this camp, there are people who do things called uh, uh, action research. Now, in the classroom, action research is used quite a lot. So the classroom is a place of action and decision, and we have to have strategies for how we get the learners to learn. And the truth is that within any classroom we do see some evidence of regularities. We do see some things which appear to be reliable in our judgment. We know there's a particular resource that works or there's a particular pedagogic technique that we trust. And we have opportunities to explain those regularities. And we have continual opportunities to explore doing new things as well within the classroom. And it's this balance between trying to explore the regularities, the small regularities that we see and the context within which they occur, and always trying to do new things in the classroom, trying to improve our practice. It's that balance that we're always wrestling with as educational researchers. I think the best analogy to this searching process is the process that an artist goes through when they, when they have to go and find their voice as, as an artist. Artists um, have to acquire some sort of technique to help them to paint. Now, the picture I've got here is, is showing the different stages in which an artist might go through to actually create something that's, that's beautiful and expressive. And in the same way, uh, researchers will come to university and say, I want to research something. And they might meet a supervisor and the supervisor will say, well, you need, you need a methodology. And that's true to a point, but the problem is that whatever methodology that you pick out of a textbook will be someone else's opinion about how the world works, and it won't necessarily be your opinion about how the world works. And what you have to do as a researcher, which is the same as what an artist has to do, is that you have to find your own methodology, you have to find your own technique, which is completely sort of integrated with the, the thing that you're really interested in, with the thing that you really want to say. And in this exercise that I want you to do this week, that's really what I want you to have a go at, is to find out what it is that you really want to say, what it is your deep values are and your thoughts are about the way the world is. And once you've got an understanding of how you think the world is, then you can start to really think critically about the methodological practices that you might um, use in order to really bring your research to life. And this is me having a go. So this is a blog post that I've written. And the first thing I'm going to do is to um, look at what my conclusions are. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, scroll to the end here and have a look at my conclusions. So I can see uh, Basically, I'm uh, complaining about uh, models, people being over-attached to models in e-learning. Um, basically, the models, sometimes it seems that the models can't be right, uh, but we don't critique them. So, um, 
Most scientists on encountering results that fail to meet theory would consider changing their theory, but we don't do this in education. So that's my, that's my argument here, that's my conclusion. And now I have to ask, okay, well how do I reach that conclusion? What's, what's my process of thought? Um, now, in fact, I'm not using a method myself, but what I'm doing is critiquing somebody else's method. And I'm critiquing the method used by um, Diana Laurelard when she talks about her empirical work. And I'm saying, well, what does she mean by empirical work? And, and the empirical work that she draws attention to is someone else's research that says, you know, teachers have too little time to find and evaluate software, they have, uh, don't have appropriate training and so on. And I'm saying, well, these findings are the result of questions which presuppose that something else ought to be happening. And the thing that ought to be happening for Lorillard is that the model of um, learning with technology that she has, and she's, she's made her whole career based on this model, she thinks that that model ought to be uh, realized in practice. And because it isn't realized in practice, there must be something wrong with the way education is organized. That, that appears to be her argument. And so uh, that's kind of what I'm writing here. Um, now, what do I think about that? Well, I think the truth is, if your theory isn't realised in practice, the chances are you need to probably have a look at your theory. And I think Lorillard's model, her theory, is wrong because it fails to account for the emotional richness of the learning experience. Um, it also fails to account for uh, theorists actually wanting to think that their model is right. Um, there, there, you know, there's real problems in, in explaining this. And, well, what does this tell me about me? It's not that I don't think models are useful, but I do think that they get in the way, or they, if they get in the way of thinking and, and caring about each other, which I think is the most important thing, then, then we have a problem. If you're so wedded to your model that it blinds you to the obvious things that happen in the classroom around you, then clearly there's something wrong. Um, I think, you know, the, the nature of the world, what do I think about, well, I think the world produces many complex phenomena which we uh, continually try to, um, to understand, but we have a tendency to confuse our understanding with the reality, and that's, that's really how I think the world is, and that's what I think um, my methodology is trying to uh, trying to get to grips with.